Palmer bet with the big don't argue. Punters will love that. Download our app today and enjoy tackle busting benefits with great odds, more markets, and same game multi every NRL match at Palmer Bet. Gamble responsibly. For gambler's help, call 1 800 858 858. Welcome everyone to episode 409 of Fergo and the Freak. I'm your host, the Glorious League Freak, and I'm joined today by somebody that doesn't need any introduction, who just described himself as the talent to me literally five minutes ago. He is the number one rugby league statistician in all of the world, and he is the owner and operator of Rugby League Project. His name is Andrew Ferguson. Hello, Andrew Ferguson. Hello there. Have have I been paid for this appearance? Yes, you have, you bastard. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, I can talk now. I can talk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now, today, the reason I'm doing the intro is because today some stuff happened and I wanted to get your thoughts on it. Now, there's a couple of things that happened. First of all, a couple of days ago, we found out that Nathan Brown approached the New Zealand Warriors and informed the New Zealand Warriors that he wasn't willing to move to New Zealand to coach the New Zealand Warriors on the verge of them going back to New Zealand to play games in New Zealand. Uh, Subsequently, today, the New Zealand Warriors and Nathan Brown have parted ways and he has been replaced by assistant coach Stacey Jones. Then, not too long after that, we had the West Tigers come out and I thought really underhandedly on the eve of State of Origin decided to sack Mark Maguire. Uh, they terminated that fucking bastard. And, you know, <laughs> something you probably haven't seen is that Tim Sheens fronted the media because Mark Maguire has been replaced by Brett Kamali at this stage. He will Brett Kamali will coach the West Tigers for the rest of the year. One of the quotes Tim Sheens said uh, at the press conference was that Mark Maguire was becoming an issue in the terms of recruitment and retention and if you couldn't say that Mark Maguire would be there in three to four years time it's probably best to sack him now so they sacked Mark Maguire now and replaced him with the guy that will be there just until the end of the year Andrew do you have any thoughts and opinions on what has happened at the West Tigers first of all yeah look uh, essentially there's um, a few useless dumb fucks who think they're really important because they're at the top of a board at the uh, at an NRL club. They think that makes them celebrities or some shit. I don't know. Um, and so they've decided to go about sacking the people that they hired. Apparently that makes them good at what they do. Um, and they, they, I mean, this is a consistent cycle they do. Um, they lucked out by getting a premiership winning coach, a proven intelligent coach so you know what i'll take that fucking hit to my reputation i'll coach your shit club and then went with an application like that how can we say no and uh michael mcguire came on board and i think michael mcguire pretty much very early on learnt how shit this board was at running a club and also learned how untouchable they were hence why he's been treading water most of the time Part of it's also because the same board allowed um, Ivan Cleary, who they also allowed to walk out on the club, um, to sign a bunch of plotters on big contracts for four-year terms, which basically um, it, it basically kept Maguire in handcuffs for three seasons. Yeah, this is really the first season where he would have had any wiggle room because of those terrible contracts. Yeah, and they tied so much money up in those things. Millions, millions. So this would have been, this should have been the first of his proper three-year deal. Um, Instead, it's not. Um, They keep, we can talk about bits and pieces here, okay, but there's one thing you can always look back on to understand how poor this board is at running the club. The only player that they've extended for more than a season in this current roster is the fucking winger. 
the winger. They've got him on for another three years or some shit, and he's to not be, cheap either. To be fair, he's a he's a pretty middling winger. He's he's not. <laughs> he's fucking not. Have you noticed any difference from the the way the Tigers have played since he's been gone? No, no one has. No, no, they they're not missing no. any strike out wide. No, he's a fucking winger. Yeah, yeah, uh, on big money, and they've also gone out and. The board members, not the coach, the board members have gone out and publicly stated that they want the halfback Luke Brooks to remain a West Tigers player for the rest of his career. All they're doing there is just saying to the uh, to the player manager, <laughs> you know where we stand. Yeah, it doesn't it- matter what offer you get at another club, we'll fucking beat it. And the manager's going, you ripper. You would say they basically went to the player manager of Luke Brooks and said, look, just bend us over. But he's bent them over for the last three years already. Yeah. They're akin to the people who go to an auction. And they say, you know, we'll bid, we'll bid a million dollars for this property. And the auctioneer will go, million dollars, that's the final offer. Going once, going twice. And then the same person puts up and goes, no, no. We'll make it one point one million. They say, but you already have the bid at one million. I just want to be sure. Let's go one point one. Going once, go no, you know what, let's make it one point two. And they just keep raising the fucking bid on themselves because they're so stupid. Yeah, like it is crazy to think Luke Brooks is one of the highest paid players in rugby league right now. Yes. Um, especially coming up to a point where now Adam Dewey's coming back and you I, I think that it's fair to say between Dewey, uh, Jackson Hastings, and what's the young bloke's name that's been playing pretty good? Um, the Simpkin? No, no, the other dude, the the young half. Oh, yeah, uh, I forgot his name. name. I keep anyway, up with Simpkin. he's been playing pretty good. Yes. Like, of all of them, Brooks is number four. Yeah. This is the problem they've got to now is – how many of the players that have been brought to the club have come to the club because they wanted to play under match? I'm, I'm pretty certain that Dewey um, liked Maguire's style when he was coaching at South, when mm-hmm. Dewey was playing there. Mm-hmm. The, the thing I don't understand is that the West Tigers at times under Maguire have looked putrid. And you've looked at the team and said, look, he hasn't got anything to work with they have finally looked like they're building something. Like, finally, after all this time, there feels like there's been something that's changed even a little bit. And just when you see that shred of, like, there's maybe a bit of light at the end of the tunnel, they sack him. And they sack him on the eve of origin. And I bet you money they wanted this news to come out tomorrow morning. And you can't just sack a coach. It, it There's a lot of stuff that, like, just the payment to him would take some time to make sure that's lined up. And I bet that it they had to announce it today because it was coming out today. They knew the news was going to break anyway. I just think it's underhanded. I think the fact that the club timed it this way says a lot about the priorities of the people running the club. They're not performance-based. And I think that it also shows that when you've got a coaching director in there, and look, Tim Sheens has been in rugby league for longer than I've been alive. I would never question his rugby league knowledge, but I think it's fair to say whenever you get a coaching director come in, they always get rid of the dude that they didn't hire. Correct. And they, you know, and any coach that goes in should not have a coaching director because that's just an ax hanging over your head. It certainly is. And I, I had a feeling that that was going to happen the minute they signed him. I went, ah, oh, here we go. I'll ax to grind sheens is back. You know, um, you know, one of the things they said is they want a development coach. Can you tell me what the fuck a development coach is and why that's different from a real coach? It's what Tim Sheens believed he was. That's all I can think is that it, it's a, a mindset of somebody that thinks that they did a certain thing. Yeah. And it's... This is- and this, it's one of these conflicting things. They talk about wanting a development coach, but at the same time, they criticise Maguire for not being able to attract, not develop, attract mm-hmm. talent to the club. Going, yeah. Pick one. Do you want to recruit top quality stars or do you want to develop players? You well, can't sit there and say one thing and criticise the coach of not doing something completely different. They're not 
they're not the same thing. It's a completely different argument for both of them. It's like you're trying to find a reason to justify sacking Maguire when you don't genuinely have one. And how can yeah. you talk about development when you're going to put an interim coach and you haven't even decided who your next coach is going to be? And, <laughs> I mean, God help us. Who, what, what sort of best option have they got out there other than Maguire? I'll... Well, that's the thing. It's like, it, look, if the Bulldogs have Maguire on their payroll right now, as we record this, I would say that is the smartest thing the Bulldogs have done in like eight years. You know, because Maguire is a really good coach. He's a proven coach. What is the market right now is you've got the West Tigers. They're looking for a coach now and are one of the worst situations you could walk into as a coach. You've got the New Zealand Warriors who are in a terrible situation, but there's some things you can work there if you're thinking long term. And they're going to the give you Warriors a have a ton of potential. Yeah. You look at yeah. the number of, of players that are coming from New Zealand and the Pacific Islands. And they're not finding their way into the Warriors system. So no. they go to Sydney. They've got that big ta- pool of talent there just waiting to be, you know, kept to themselves. They they just need a smart operator there to to, to nurture that and, and hold them there and pick the best ones they want for themselves. They'd be fine. Exactly. Exactly. And and though so that's a good situation once that club has settled down, right? Then you've got the Gold Coast Titans. They're next. They need a new coach. And yet all of these clubs are going to be looking for a coach. And that's not even to say the Bulldogs. All of these clubs are looking for a coach. And it is one of the worst coaching times that I can think of where they're, like, they're all talking about Cameron Seraldo, And Cameron Seraldo sitting back saying, I'm not going to go to a terrible club. And so they're either going to have to pay overs for him for a guy that we don't know if he's a good first grade coach. You never know until they've coached mm-hmm. and, and, or it's Michael McGuire. <laughs> you know, they're the two best options out there. And the West Tigers just sacked one of them. It's, and, and again, it proves how shit that board is, how, how little they know about running a football club. Mm-hmm. So, and I, I said it before, if the club decides that they want to get rid of Michael Maguire, you know what? Fine. But make sure that the people who hire the next coach are not the people who just sacked the current one. Yes. Because Pasco has, I don't I can't remember when he started. I know that now that he's seen at least two coaches go by. And by the way, had to pay them their money. Yeah. Has had to so, pay money, dead money, to coaches that weren't coaching the club. So every time a CEO or a board sacks a coach that they hired, whether they say it or not, that's an admission that they got it wrong. Mm-hmm. If they knew what they were doing and they were good at what they were doing, they wouldn't be sacking anyone that they hired unless that person's done something wrong by the club. Maguire hasn't done anything wrong by the club. They've just decided all of a sudden now, after a decade of not making the finals, oh, we're a results-based business. Hang on. Really? Since are when? You, are you really results-based? Really? Since fucking when? I, I don't get it. And the more, as every season rolls by, it becomes more and more bleedingly obvious that 2005 becomes a, more and more of a fluke. How yeah, else do you justify it? 2006 didn't even make the finals, and it took them another five years after then before they made the finals again, and a decade since. Nothing. They yeah, it's, it. a, it's an anomaly. You can look at that and say, you know what? That was – and I, I'm not one to do this. I know you've talked about this before where you've said, like, this was a fluke, right? I don't like saying that about a premiership winning team because I think that – I, I think you can it can take away, and there's nothing you can take away from that West Tigers team. It was fantastic. But I think you can look at the overall performance of the West Tigers as a club and say, you know what? In this club's history, that was definitely a fluke. Yeah, it's a weird blip on the radar. Yeah. The other, it's, it's a weird blip just like they have never won a wooden spoon as a weird blip. Yes, yes. Just how? That seems to be the, the one achievement they should have achieved by now. Even the Broncos have got one since. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> I I don't get it. I don't get it. And 
It's Who's better than constant. Maguire? This, that's the thing to me. Like, who is better than Michael Maguire to coach this side? Who is the dude that they said, you know what? Maguire isn't the dude, but this other guy is the guy that we want to coach them. Here's the that, problem. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't matter who they... They could hire Craig Bellamy. The board and the CEO will not... doesn't matter what Tim Sheen says. I guarantee you, they will not give that coach full reign to do everything they need to do as much as they wish to. They'll probably give him most of the stuff. Mm. They will give him full control, though, because they want to have some of that control. They and want this... to be like Sir Alex Ferguson. That's in their yeah. fucking head. They think they're famous and important and they've got something to do with the results on the field. They won't sit there and own the fucking losses. They palm that shit off to the coach and then sack him. But they'll sit there and they'll gallivant about and they'll be in the fucking media talking about how good it is that the team won when they get the victories. Doesn't work like that. When your team's losing, you can't just fucking palm it off to the coach and blame him and then take all the glory when you get a win. No, 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 no. That's called being a fucking soft cock cunt. Stop doing it. I fucking hate the CEO that does this. I hate the prick on the fucking board who does this shit. Oh, man. This, it's the people on the top that irritate me so much because it doesn't matter who they hire. We're going to go through this cycle all over again. Mm-hmm. Ooh, results based club. You just what have Tim to... Sheens wants is Tim Sheens' as coach. It, they, that's what they all want, though, Andrew. You know yeah. who Phil Gould's looking to coach the Bulldogs? Phil fucking Gould. Exactly right. But they'll tell you, oh, no, I'm too old for that. I don't want to do that. And go, yeah, bullshit. Exactly. And that's the thing. The West Tigers, uh, Any, just say, let's just say Craig Bellamy becomes available. And he says, you know what? I want to move to Campbelltown. All right. I, I, you know what? I want a challenge. I, I want a challenge. I, I'm sick of winning, right? I'm sick of. <laughs> I'm, I'm a really happy guy right now, and I'm not really a big fan of happiness. So I want to move to Campbelltown, and I want to coach a really terrible club. And he goes to the West Tigers. The first thing he says is, "You get rid of Tim Sheens. Yeah, no good coach is going to go in underneath a coaching director. No, no you one. can't. You can't focus on what's going on in the field when you're constantly looking over your shoulder at a bloke holding a knife." Yes, it, you, a coach doesn't have a boss. Okay, a coach should be a coach should be able to walk into the board and say, "I want this, this, and this," and the board says, "No worries, we'll try and get that for you." That's the coach's job. Okay, at the and now I'm talking about at the ultimate level. Okay, no one's Wayne Bennett's boss. You know, nobody, no. nobody is Ivan Cleary's boss. You know, I'm not Trent saying Robertson. Ivan Clear is on the Wayne Bennett level, but that's where your coach has to be to be that thing that you want out of a good coach. Yeah. Your board and your CEO have to have 100% trust and faith in the coach in order to get that return to them. And that's the problem the West Tigers have had for a long time is that since since they got rid of Sheens in that messy fucking split, every coach they've had since then, they have not given them... the all of the keys to fucking run the club as they wish. Well, what's the longest? I mean, is like the longest coach that's been in there, maybe two and a half years, something like that. Oh, it's Maguire, whatever he's done. Yeah. Nearly three yeah. years. And it's, it's just a symptom of the club and how it's run. And I look, we've talked about everything that the West Tigers have at their feet. It's, it's a rude amount of natural rugby league resources. And for the club to be in the situation it is, is abysmal. And now they've got rid of their coach. They've put in Brett Kamali. I don't know why Brett Kamali. Like, do you have um, any idea why Brett Kamali? Yeah, so Macaulay's, uh, Kamali's been coaching in the lower grades, and the lower grade sides are doing pretty well. Mm-hmm. Um, that's basically it. But, okay. I mean, in, in the old days, that's kind of how coaches made it into first graders, you know, lots of good success in the lower grades. Um, the last coach I'm aware of that the West Tigers signed based purely on their lower grades coaching was Terry Lamb. <laughs> oh, Jesus. You know, he that, had a really that... good, yeah, he had a really good coaching record at the Bulldogs in their lower grades and they signed him based on that. It, you know, when you were talking about lower grade success, all I could think of was Garth Brennan. Yeah, who <laughs> didn't, won. didn't Matthew Johns push hard for him? Oh man! <laughs> oh man! I still I, I will not forget that he was pushing hard for Garth Brennan. I, don't, I like I don't know. We've talked about the West Tigers so many times on the podcast, and we've both said so much about this club. Um, 
what what do you hope for what do you hope for to come out of this let's let's try and be positive what do you hope for that comes out of this that's positive um what they need to do it's actually very similar to what the warriors need to do and that is say to a coach you know what we're going to bite the bullet here we're going to put this coach on a five-year deal and we promise we'll make it fucking legally binding that we will not sack you or have you leave until you see out that five years unless you choose to leave or you do something that brings the club into disrepute other than that we want you for five years your goal initially is to set up our junior pathways get us some stability from within and then try and get some um, quality players to the side and by year three, four, five, by year three, we want to be pushing towards the top eight. By year four, we want to be in the top eight. By year five, we want to be seen as a team that's a top six team at small steps. But if you try and do things in fast steps, what you get is one season really great and then the rest just turns to shit all around it and you've made, you have actually built nothing. You look at 2005 as a good example. Tim mm. Sheen's come in. He set up that juniors base. It was really, really good. They come through. They had that great bit of success in 2005, and then it fell away. And it took them five years to get back into the finals. And then yeah. it fell away again. And, and they, look, I think it's fair to say they wasted some of the best years of one of the best players in the world in Benji Marshall. And that's not that's not on Benji Marshall. I watched Benji Marshall do some ridiculous things in terrible teams and win games single-handedly. But I think it's fair to say that the West Tigers should have been a contender pretty much every year he was there. Yeah, absolutely. And not to mention that, I mean, what they did to the reputation of Robbie Farah. Mm -hmm. They tried to turn him against the club just so they could get rid of him and bring in a coach and brought in... Matt Ballon, who played less than 80 minutes in his entire time with the West Tigers. On that, all co- that money, through all the injuries that he had. He was brought in purely to make sure that we didn't have to put Farrah in the first grade side. That sort of vindictive horse shit. Just no. And, the, and, and I know no, that was a different board, but it's still, you just don't have that shit. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's silly. Um, what coach, what actual coach, like, have you got a name that you would like to take over this coaching role that's available or that you feel like they could get, um, and it's going to come down to money because it's not the situation. So with the right amount of money. I I legit don't know. Yeah, I get that. I don't, I wouldn't um, have a clue either. Because as I said, you want a coach who you can put in there long term. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot of those sort of coaches out there who you can get to do something long term and actually build things up. Um, and the ones I think of are, you know, guys who are retired. Because um, I'm not looking at after five years where we we're premiers. Mm-hmm. What you want to do is build up to a point where you are consistently in the finals. Mm-hmm. But I would rather be, um, what's a good example? I guess a club like the Sharks where they've been able to have a change of coach, massive change of the roster, but they've only missed the finals once in, what, the last 10 years or so? Yeah. And, yeah, there's that stuff with the salary cap and whatnot. And, yeah, obviously, but even and the, the drugs. from that... Oh, well, that's further than 10 years ago, isn't it? Nearly. Not to me. Nearly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <they've, laughs> I suppose even looking since, since that um, cheating... Prick fucking got the ass, and they had John Morris in there, and they changed over to another coach, and they had a big change of their roster uh, this year. They're still one of the top sides in the competition, and they're not outside the top eight. They've stayed in there the whole year. Um, they only just missed the finals last year. They're in the finals the year before that. You know, they're they're going through a, a major shift and change in the way they do things, and in their roster, in their coaching department, and yet it hasn't impacted them on the field that much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's because they've built a good, a good juniors base. They don't have a large one, but they've built a good one. They've got there in a good junior system, and they're able to recruit very good players to the club. That's what the Tigers need to be looking at doing: yeah. juniors and be attractive to other clubs. If you can get those two things right, success will generally follow in your direction. And you know, they can't, that, they, I was going to say sorry. they can't sit there and say that you know, oh, you know, 
it's hard to attract players when we're based far out wide, far out west and going, Penrith's having no issues being successful. <laughs> exactly. And, and they're based at fucking Concord. Like... Yeah, I mean, we've been through that before. They need to yeah. pick one spot. They need to be based there, and they need to build the fucking community around them. You can't build a community of support around a club when you're trying to build it in three different fucking communities. Yeah. The, pick the, one. It makes me wonder if uh, Morris would be a good fit for the Tigers. And, and the only reason I would think maybe not is because you, in an ideal situation, they would get somebody with – a proven track record, which Morris has, but you kind of need somebody that can go in and say, put put their premiership ring on the table, you know, and say, look, I've been there. I've done that. I know what it takes. And Morris hasn't done that as a coach, but I think Morris proved himself at the, at the Sharks and he brought through a lot of young players and, and made his older players perform as well and made them a really good defensive team and, and probably got more out of that team than they really should have got, you know, out in the field. That's all you can ask for as a coach. And so maybe he would be a good option. But the real question here is, uh, are you ready for the Shane Flanagan era to begin? That's my biggest fear. I know. Because when you've just sat a premiership winning coach, I fear the club's going to say, well, the only thing we can do is try and get another premiership winning coach. And there's no others out there that I'm aware of other than that fucking prick. Yeah. So what are they going to do? I wouldn't be surprised if they signed him. I wouldn't be surprised if they said, look, Shane, you know, you've been sacked. You've got a bit of a tarnished reputation. So we're going to offer you like, say, 400 grand a year. The fellow says, uh, my my starting price is a million, and the Clogers go, "How's about one point two million a year?" He goes, "Oh, we do one point three, okay, one point four it is." And we'll go, "The fuck just happened?" Yeah. I'll say this though: if they sign Flanagan, mm-hmm. I'm not watching any more of their games. Yeah, I I understand that. I I, I just I've seen people. I saw some some Warriors fans saying they wanted Flanagan and. I've seen some Bulldogs fans say it as well. I I can't believe anybody would be thinking that when you consider uh, what was going on when he was a coach. He basically broke all of the rules that he could have possibly broken and really left the the Sharks devastated as a club, Like, like tarnished on and off the field and just in a really... Like, they, he took a club that people kind of had a soft spot, spot for and changed that. And I think that says a lot. Um, and that that's yeah. what worries me, too. If he goes to the West Tigers, I'll be – like, I'll be sad for you because you're my mate and I know how it would affect you. But I just – I that any club would be associated with that is outrageous to me, absolutely outrageous. And I just hope that that doesn't happen. To it, I will take if if they say Flanagan, I'll say to them, you know what? I know of a coach who's available, um, had a bit of success, and is not a cheating prick that I would rather have. And I'm saying I I want this as my first priority. I'm saying I'd rather have this guy over Flanagan. That's Richard Agar. <laughs> well, you know what? He's been snapped up, Andrew. <sighs> He's oh. he's off the he's off you know the witness Viking snapped him up, locked him oh. in. Who's the witness coach? I don't know. I don't know who the witness coach was. Let's huh? have a look. Let's have a look. He's going to be available. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever that guy was. <laughs> who is it? You didn't get O'Brien. Which one of those two was it? Raw, Raw, is it Ryan O'Brien? There we go. Right. Yeah, I think he might be the interim. Points. He's probably the interim coach. So Simon Finnegan. I'll take Simon Finnegan. Okay. Okay. He was undefeated at Newcastle. Oh, really? At the Thunder? Yeah. That's pretty handy. Um, 28 to 8 over Midlands, 30 to 22 over Workington, 38 to 30 over Dewsbury. Defence needs a bit of work, but, you know, the Tigers are pretty shit in that area, but he's good with attack. Dare I say he was an attacking architect? Oh. Oh. 
Surely there's only one attacking architect. <laughs> yeah, well, he's watching the games on TV too. Um, <laughs> now let's look at the uh, the the, the, the uh, New Zealand Warriors situation because the West Tigers situation is really bad. It it's really bad. This situation with Nathan Brown is fucking outrageous and just adds to a long list for him of weird situations where there's some fucking drama and something weird happens and then out of nowhere he's out. Like, does Nathan Brown understand that when you coach a side called New Zealand, it's probably going to be based in New Zealand? Like, what the fuck was all that about? Yeah, so I was just looking around. I found a few quotes here from from Nathan Brown in a rare um, article on the Fox Sports website where they've actually quoted someone. Oh, wow. Um, He said, look, the people I work for at the Warriors are champion people, and I told them my situation two weeks ago. I spoke to my family. My head coaching days are finished. I told them I'm not going to appear at another club. I said, you decide whether you want me to stay for the rest of this year or not, but my head coaching days are over. I'm going into another field in rugby league, and I'm going to honour my word, what I said to those blokes. Uh, I'm basically going to help some other coach keep a job so that you blokes stay off their back. That's what I'd like to do. What that looks like, I'm not too sure, but I've seen far too many coaches over my 20 years as a head coach basically get resold because the clubs have done a poor job and haven't supported them. I've been lucky enough to survive. People (laughs) survive. Jesus. People like Trent Barrett and all these blokes are terrific coaches, but they coach teams that had bad rosters that weren't organized properly. I would like to help a young coach survive. That's what I'd like to do going forward. So my head coaching goes over. I can't coach if my daughters aren't prepared to move anymore, so it is their fault as much as I love them. What? So it has That's nothing a- to do with his abysmal performance as a coach. It's everything else around that. It's his daughter's fault. <laughs> Why isn't that the headline? Seriously. Brown blames daughters for not being able to take on the coaching role. Seriously. I didn't, I, I hadn't heard that before. Hey, I've got my head in my hands. Like, Andrew, can you imagine? Okay, I'm, I'm Andrew. Reading this, I'm reading Andrew. this somewhat sensible statement going, okay, I'll see where he wants to go. And then at the end, he just gets thrown this. What the fuck was that? <laughs> imagine that. Imagine, in right? in imagine. the end, I couldn't get the tomato sauce I wanted in Auckland. So I thought, fuck it, I'm not coaching anymore. <laughs> imagine, right? You're you're down there and <laughs> you're, you're in Melbourne, right? And someone offers you a job, right, up in Sydney, and you come out and you say, you know what, I would have taken it, but my daughter, and you just throw your daughter under the bus. Yeah. <laughs> what the? She fuck? Do, she doesn't. She's sick of me coming home late on the train from Melbourne. I don't think she'd like it if we moved to Sydney. Uh, so you know. Daughter under the bus. Yeah. Oh shit! That's so funny. <laughs> Oh, he's my oh. daughter. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, she's got a cough at now from Warriors fans. <laughs> <Is You're, that... laughs> you imagine her school. Your dad fucked my club. <laughs> he blamed his daughter. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, man. That's ridiculous. Oh, I hadn't heard that. That's fucking hilarious. Oh, man. That's that's some excuse. Wow. Yeah, well, you know, Nathan Brown's daughter. How about that? Oh, jeez. That's rough. See, there's always something weird with him. <laughs> it was, at one point, it was Little Wayne. <laughs> Oh, shit. No. Oh, shit. Oh, tears, man. Tears. Oh, man. Anyway, uh, it's good that he's going to help some young coach do what he was trying to do. (laughs) So, hang on. If if he's... I've got to figure out I'm going to say this. If his daughter's the reason why he's not coaching anymore, and he, at the same time, wants to help other young coaches survive is his advice going to be as a young coach don't fuck your wife because if you have kids kids, you're not going to be able to move to another coaching job is that the is that the wisdom that he has 
goes, he goes to he goes to Cameron Serrano and he says, "Listen, Cameron, right? Don't listen to anything my daughter says. <laughs> She's fucking she, nuts, man. She'll ruin it for you, man." I asked her to I asked her to draw up like a bit of a uh, an attacking plan for me, and she drew Garfield. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that's terrible. Oh boy, I didn't expect that. That threw me. Oh my goodness. See, that's what happens when you read an article live and not get to pre-read it beforehand. Yeah. Oh boy, <laughs> that's uh, that's outrageous. Oh, my brain has gone into car crash mode over that. <laughs> I've blue screened. That's amazing. <laughs> I've heard some excuses, but wow. Yeah. I like the idea that, that he's going to help some young coach do what he couldn't do. Like how the, and he doesn't even, he's like, I've got a plan to go into something. I don't know what that is yet. It's like, that's not having a plan, dude. <laughs> having a plan is a plan. It's not saying I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Fuck. Oh, uh. I've, that's made me cry laughing. That's hilarious. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I've got some quotes here from Tim Sheens. Um, wait, Paul Ken asked him, you know, is there any reason why Maguire didn't work out at the club? And Sheen said, that's something I can't answer for a million reasons, mate, but it's a round peg in a square hole. Madge is a good coach. Well, he can't answer them for a million reasons, but and then says he didn't fit in at the club, basically. Round peg in a square hole. What does he think he's look like? We know what he's looking for. He's looking for Tim Sheens as a twenty-year-old coach, but that's all right. It, it it like it's not rocket surgery, you know. It's footy coaching. You're either a good coach or you're not. Yeah. Um. Kent then asked Sheens on reports that Maguire was not in charge of all of the club's recruitment while he was the coach. And Kent said, "We know that about him, but we haven't been told. We've been told reports he is not in charge of his own recruitment. This is the first time these journalists have said anything about that. They've been happy to lay the boot in and say, oh, Maguire will be lucky to see out the season.' Blah 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 blah. Mm-hmm. They never once come to his defence until he gets sacked. Yeah, it's weird. There's a reason for that because they will sit there and they'll rally for a coach to get sacked because that creates news, mm-hmm. so they can report about the sacking." And then, then they jump to the defense of that coach to create some sort of turmoil within the club, which creates just more and more news. Yeah, it's news. Yeah, yeah. They don't know anything. These these dickhead writers. No, no. It's just so, news generation. That's all they're doing. So, what did Sheen say to that? Um, he said garbage. There's not a player there that he hasn't signed or re-signed. Not one mate. Apart from uh, the ones he did, like, he, I mean, he didn't sign Brooks to that massive deal. Initially had the problem, which is what we're facing now with our recruiting into next year. <laughs> Seriously, this is a club before Michael Maguire got there, right? That we And we've joked about it. Their recruitment starts in about November when everyone else is signed. Like, yeah. you can't blame the Tigers' recruitment on Michael Maguire. No. This is a... There is not a player at the club that Maguire hasn't signed or re-signed, not one. And then he says, initially, he had the problem, which is what we are facing now with our recruiting into next year. So, if Maguire is involved with the signing and re-signing of every player currently at the club, and this is... Not every single player is off contract at the end of this year at that club. Yeah. Which means they've got players going into next season who will be there, mm-hmm. who have been signed by <laughs> Maguire or re-signed by him, but they're saying now that they've got no... <laughs> oh, but, that, but then the thing is too, like, he's saying that... If he's saying that Maguire was part of the problem in terms of his recruitment, right, which is outrageous. But just say he's saying that. Now that recruitment process is either on Brett Kamali's shoulders or on Tim Sheen's shoulders. It'll and be Tim doing it, Yeah, and then they're doing it now going forward, trying to sign players who they're going to have to say, look, we don't know who the coach is going to be yeah. at this stage. How is that any better than having Maguire in place? It, it's like... 
it just doesn't make sense. So we've got the Michael was involved with recruiting into next year. At this stage, we didn't think that was going to work, and we needed to have someone who was going to control the club and the recruitment for next year. So where is say, that dude? Yeah, they haven't got that person. Yeah. <laughs> this sounds like a Nathan Brown plan, hey? <laughs> yeah. To say he wasn't in charge is absolute rubbish. He was on our retention committee. No decision was ever made without Michael's approval. There's a difference between getting his approval and having him have full control over who gets retained and who gets signed. If he comes out and they say, we've just re-signed David Nofaluma for four years, he said, well, what the fuck can I say about that? You've already done it. It, Do you reckon that Craig Bellamy has a retention committee? Like a recruitment committee? Do you reckon that like Wayne Bennett has ever had to go to a committee and talk to anybody else? No, because like, those clubs go, we've got one of the best coaches here. You know, that's, yeah, that's his job. You go. We trust him. Yeah. The only thing you'd be, they'd be, that coach would be dealing with the board on is the salary cap. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, <clears throat> it's outrageous. It's, um, he's so, oh man, can you imagine the relief Mike Maguire feels right now? I'd say probably right now, listening to these comments, um, furious. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think it'll probably come in a week or so's time, relieved that he doesn't have to deal with this horse shit anymore. Mm -hmm. The only problem we've got is um, how much damage working at this club might have done to his reputation as a coach and whether... um, He's able to pick up another coaching gig in the NRL. I'm almost certain he'll land a gig in the Super League. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he would definitely. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he's already fielding calls from him. Um, whether he wants to go over there is another thing. He'd be very handy at the Warriors. Um, I, I wonder, though, if because he's the coach of the New Zealand Test team. Yeah, and it makes sense. Well, to me, I don't know that it does. Sometimes I think that you need that separation. Maybe like I, I think though, because the, I think if you're if you're a sixteen year old junior in New Zealand, and you know you see that the coach of the New Zealand rugby league team is also the coach of the Auckland Warriors, mm-hmm. you go through all the That's Warriors. Good, yeah, you go. Oh, if I play really well for the Warriors. I'm actually playing for the actual Kiwi coach. It might be just a, a step into playing for New Zealand. Um, we can't say that doesn't exist because um, Keith Galloway played test footy, didn't he? <laughs> Did he play test footy? I know he played Origin. Yeah. Um, Chris Lawrence. Oh, I'm a huge fan of Chris Lawrence, especially when he was playing a centre in his peak. He, would have been very close to deserving that spot in the test side. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is probably just a little bit of, uh, you know, favourites going on there because his coach was the Australian coach at the time. Yeah. Yeah, and we've talked about that. Coaches love people that they have dealt with and relied upon and – um. Uh, the, you know, that familiarity, you know, and you see it in all sorts of coaching levels. And at, once you accept that that happens, you get less angry about when you see it kicking in at different levels. Um, but, yeah, I, look, I, I never thought about it with targeting youngsters, say, if, if Maguire did become the New Zealand Warriors coach. Uh, and, you you know, young players would be like, well, he's the test coach. I don't know. I Personally, I think that just – I always think of the worst-case scenario in terms of coaches. So, like, I don't like it when a team has one of their former greats as, come in as a coach because then you've got to one day sack your former great at the club, you know? Like, yeah. once upon a time, the Penrith Panthers had to sack Roycey Simmons as a coach, and that's not nice. I don't like those situations, and I feel as though if – New Zealand Rugby League has so much wrapped up in Maguire as the test coach and as the club coach. If it goes south either one of those ways, it has to go kind of south for all of it. Does that make sense? 
No, that's right. I'm with you on that one. Um, yeah, I I wouldn't have put Stacey Jones in it. It's kind of like when they had Danny Vadaris mm-hmm. over at the Knights. Mm-hmm. Just went. It's not too bad if it's just an interim thing. Yeah. But I I don't know. There's that temptation when you get a a, a club legend there that everyone will sort of you know get up and they play really well for this club legend in the short term. Mm-hmm. Uh, and everyone at the club loves them. So yeah. when they walk in the room and they say, you know what, if you want me to do the job, I'll do the job. Everyone looks at them with starry eyes and says, yeah, you, you should do it, you know. And I I understand it because, look, if if bloody Greg Alexander walked in the room and said, you know what, I'll coach the Panthers, I would be like, please do it, Brandy. You're the best. Like, <laughs> it's just it's it's a natural instinct to do it, and that's why I think you've kind of got to avoid it on a business basis uh, it, more than anything. You know, you've just got to have that business mindset of, look, my heart says yes a thousand times over, but I can't allow this bad situation to develop. No, that's exactly right. Um, yeah. It's a tricky one. It's, I, for me, I think though the the Warriors do need someone who's focused, probably a bit more on stopping what Nathan Brown called the player drain to Australia, and yeah. trying to get as many of those young talents heading towards the Warriors. And I think having the national coach there is that sort of um, that lure, I guess, that will keep them in New Zealand and wanting to stay with the Warriors because they, they might see it as a, um, you know, a faster way into the test arena. Yeah. Whether you it know, is or not, it's a different matter. But if you give them that impression that, you know, you get to play for the New Zealand test coach, which means yeah. you might improve your chances of playing test footy, might be enough to stop some kids going to rugby union, for example, and they might keep them in the system and then at the Warriors as well. And it could be just enough to build up a strong player base at the Warriors that they can actually start being successful without having to fork out shit tons of money on luring players across who would have to be overpaid. You know what I would love to see out of the next New Zealand coach, the New Zealand Warriors coach, that is? I would love to see them get the get the job as soon as possible but not take over the coaching role until next year. And I would like them to go over to New Zealand and sort out all the background stuff first right yes and i would like them to be out in the media and say we need to bring back the under 20s comp as soon as possible because i think losing that competition was devastating for the new zealand warriors um if you look at the talent that come through for the nrl in general it was amazing what was going on there but i think for the warriors in particular it was devastating when that competition left because all of these young athletes in new zealand they they were seeing this under 20s comp and were like, I get to be part of a professional outfit right now that shows games on TV. Like, yeah. that's exciting. And that puts mm. me in the spotlight and I can go and start my career immediately with that. When that went away, all of a sudden, they, they kind of got lost, you know, and it went back to the older system where you kind of had to be for the most part, seen by Australian clubs because there's 15 Australian clubs and only one New Zealand club. And so I would like to see that sort of thing happen. Um, But at the same time, there's a big push for Christian Wolf to be given this role at the New Zealand Warriors, right? Now, Christian Wolf is the Tonga coach and what he's done as the Tonga coach is historic on an international rugby league basis for all time. We cannot take anything away from that. He's over there at the St. Helens Club and they're winning. But everybody that coaches St. Helens, for the most part, wins games. Even their worst coaches win games. Yeah. Now, I asked for you earlier to put some statistics together because I've heard that you're into statistics. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, I dabble. And and dabble a little bit. Now, I wanted to know the record of people that had been coaching the St. Helens Rugby League Club who then come across to Australia 
and took up a post within Australian Rugby League Club and you put those statistics together for those former St. Helens coaches, could you go through some of those stats? Sure. So we've got, uh, we're talking at, you know, since the NRL period, so since 1998, mm-hmm. uh, we've got Daniel Anderson. Um, he had 25 wins from 52 games. Mm-hmm. So 48.08%. It's fair to Midland. Yeah. You can see, you know, didn't coach for that long, about 50%. You know, yeah. things maybe go against him. I'm not going to say that he's a terrible coach. No. Or, you know, his cap management wasn't great. Um, Justin Holbrook, the Titans, he's had 22 wins from 58 games, so he's at 37.93%. Okay, that's, that's another that's- story. That's getting a bit steady. Mm-hmm. Um, next, I'm, I'm going from best winning percentage down, by the way, just to, oh. uh, for those listening at home. Um, I, didn't, Mick, I didn't know that. Holy shit. Go. Mick Potter, 17 wins from 51 games at 33.33%. And then we've got uh, Nathan Brown, and he's not the worst. And he's got... <laughs> 36 wins from uh, 131 games at 27.48%. Mm-hmm. Sean McRae, 12 wins from 48 games at 25%. Holy Ian, shit. <laughs> Ian Millwood, two wins from 14 games at 14%. So all up, that's 114, ga- 114 wins. From 354 games at 32.2 percent. Wow. Um, now the reason I asked you to put those statistics together is this: Do you reckon it's a good idea to sign a former St Helens coach? <laughs> yeah, I'd I'd say um, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, I I think that that really shows that this whole thing of being successful in Super League means absolutely nothing when it comes to coming over to Australia and coaching an NRL team. Like, those, they're outrageously bad, those statistics. Yeah, and consistently bad. Yeah, across pretty much all of them. Like, when you look, Daniel Daniel Anderson's the best of them, and he hasn't got a winning percentage. Um. That's terrible. That's really terrible. Yeah, they're all at under fifty percent. Well, actually, all of them except for him are under thirty-eight mm. percent. And, and like even Ian Millwood, like Ian Millwood won so many trophies over there, so many cups and everything, and his winning percentage over here was so bad. Um, it, it's, I just think that people looking at Christian Wolf's record at St. Helens and thinking that will translate into the NRL are sadly mistaken because history shows us otherwise to an extreme degree. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, I wonder if the St. Helens thing is not so much about, I mean, I'm, Pretty sure you're just me here. Not so much about St. Helens, the club itself, but more about the fact that you've come from um, being the best in the competition where the competition is so horribly lopsided. Mm-hmm. It's easy to be the best coach if you're at St. Helens or mm-hmm. Wigan, for example, a few years ago. And so you come away from that going, yeah, I kick everyone's ass. I'm the fucking best coach ever out there. And then you come over here and you're going, it's quite a lot more level and a lot harder to get success over here. And they come over here thinking that all they can do is turn up and watch a team run around. Um, and that's how you get your wins. And next thing they're realizing is, oh, fuck, it's a bit harder over here. Yeah, I, I don't know. My, like, I would think that part of it is that because of the way Super League clubs are structured, and when you look at that compared to an NRL club, which is, I mean... Like, you look at Penrith, they would have so many teams that Ivan Cleary has an eye on, at the very least, that would it would probably cover, like, it might cover half a dozen similar Super League clubs with how many players they have under contract. 
Like there's so mm. many junior levels and, you know, the the fringe players on their junior development teams and their rep teams and all these sorts of things. So the job is a much bigger scope, number one. But then I think tactically as well, there would be a very, very big difference. And then on top of that, I, I just think that, um, y- you know, coming in, as you say, going from the the penthouse to the outhouse has got to be a shock. And, oh, absolutely. And none of them have been able to do it, which is kind of weird. Like, even when you look at other Super League clubs and, and people that have been at other Super League clubs and come to Australia, like Michael Maguire is probably the best of them that I can think of. Like, can you think of anybody else that's gone from Super... And Michael Maguire's situation was kind of weird. He was a he was a assistant under Craig Bellamy. Everyone felt like he was a first-grade coach. He got a good offer from Wigan, went there, won a trophy, come straight back. Like, it was kind of a hit-and-run mission for him. Um, I, I just... I can't think of anyone that's done better than Maguire. Trent, Trent Robinson? Oh, yeah, he, yeah, yeah, he but definitely. That, that would be it, though. I'm trying to think. I, Ke- I, Kevin Walters was over there. He's done all right. Yeah. He was coaching uh, Catalan for a bit, I think. That's um, right. There's not, there's not a huge amount that they've actually gone over there and done their, like, a genuine apprenticeship over there that's provided good results over here. Yeah, I think the the structure and the style of play in the in the Super League is just too far different to what the NRL requires and what the NRL is. Yeah, um, you can't really do a genuine apprenticeship over there. It's just it's I also just complicated. Yeah, I also wonder if because if in Super League, like I watched the Challenge Cup final and I only watched the last twenty minutes of it. And so I wasn't seeing the best of the game. I was seeing the scrappy part. Both teams were close, you know. But I think that I could see where a coach kind of looks at the the landscape and sees what he has to work with and does his best, best with what he has to work with and then comes over here. And a lot of the coaching philosophies he's built up just don't translate because you're working with such a different level of talent and a different depth of talent and then every single week you're coming up like even the worst team in the competition if you don't turn up to play they will kick your ass you know yeah um if the bulldogs are on in their next game they could beat most teams like that's how the nrl works and so and but i just think that that looking at super league and saying well you know what so and so's won this many trophies i've never seen that really translate properly and I think that the St. Helens coaches, when they've come across their coaching records overall, really prove that point. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, there's, no, let's be honest, there's nothing I can disagree with you on that. You pretty much summed it up pretty damn well. I'm really <laughs> just looking for your um, <laughs> reinforcement of everything I think at this point. Um, yeah, achieved. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I was well, going to interject twice there, and I went, oh, hang on, I'll just let it go. Oh, I was going to say that. <laughs> well, I think we should wrap this episode up. It's been a back-to-back episode for us. Listen to our Origin preview. We've posted that just a few hours before, so go and listen to that. Uh, and thank you for joining us, Andrew. No, look, it's my pleasure. And I uh, assume the check's in the mail? Yeah, yeah, we've sent the check in the mail. Sweet. I, I like... I like to see checks. I hope it's one of those massive ones the size of a door. It is. You know what? We write them out in the same way that I write my letters to Peter Volandis. Beautiful, beautiful, mm. beautiful. Mm. <laughs> um, thank you to everyone for listening. Go and check out Rugby League Project, where we get all of our statistics from. Uh, go and follow Andrew on Twitter. His Twitter account is at Andrew RLP. Mine is at League Freak. Uh, and we will see you in our, probably our origin review special. How about that? We'll do that, yeah. Okay. Bye, everyone. Do root.
punters will love that. Download our app today and enjoy tackle busting benefits with great odds, more markets, and same game multi every NRL match at Palmer Bed. Gamble responsibly. For gambler's help, call 1 800 858 858.